Hi, welcome back. In this first set of slides, we're going to talk about HTML forms and iframes. Forms are essential for gathering user information from your site visitors. In HTML, the way we specify a form is using a form element that's made up of this opening and closing form tag. And then inside of it, we place all of the inputs for the different type of information we'd like to retrieve from our user. Now there's two important attributes that we have to include in our opening form tag, and the first one is an action. The action attribute will specify the location that all of the user information is sent to. So all of the information sent and all of these inputs is going to be sent to login.php in this situation. The second type of attribute that you must have inside of your opening form tag is the method attribute. And here we have the method set to post. Now there's two different types of method values that you'll use. You'll be using either get or post to specify the HTTP request type. Let's take a look at the difference between the get method versus the post method. So you can see here that I've created a very simple form that just has two inputs. The first is asking for the user's full name, the second will ask for the user's password, and the third is just a submit button that will allow us to submit the form. And you can see that the action for this form is going to post this information they fill in to the process-user.php page. Now on this PHP page, we could actually then process that information, for example, save the user to the database or determine dynamically what we should do from that point on. Um, and in this case, we're not really interested in doing that. I've just gone ahead and left this page completely blank um, because what we're really interested is looking at the HTTP headers and the different ways that this information is sent. So let's go ahead and jump back over to the browser. And inside the first name, we're going to fill in the name Bob Barkley. And for the password, we're going to go ahead and set the password to frog hop. And then I'm going to go ahead and click the submit button. Okay, and so again, this page is blank um, because we're not really interested in processing the data. But what will be of interest is down here inside of the developer tools, you can see I have the network tab open. And if we go ahead and click on this particular request, we can have a peek at the headers here. And you'll see that the request method is currently set to post. And if we scroll down here inside the headers, you'll notice that there was some form data that was also sent. And we have here the first name set to Bob Barkley and the password set to Froghop. Okay. So when you send a post request, um, all of this information is tucked away inside of those headers. Okay. Now let's take a look at the difference when we change this to a get request instead. So I'm going to go over to the method here and set this to get, and then we'll go ahead and save the page and jump back to the browser. And here we'll refresh this page, and I'm going to fill in the same name again. We'll just say Bob Barkley and we'll put in the same password which is frog hop and this time we'll submit having this set as a get request okay so one thing we can tell right off the bat that's different is if we go up here to the URL you can see that the name and the password here are actually set inside of the URL as a query string. Okay. So that is a big difference between the post and the get. Let's also take a look at the headers to see that difference. So here we can see the request method is get. And if we scroll down, um, instead of being sent as form data, we can see it's being sent via a query string parameter. We'll typically use a get request when we want to pass in a query string in the URL that will help determine how the server should send us back information. So in other words, we're asking to get back some information from the server. And that's in contrast to the post method, where we're trying to specifically post information to the server. We don't want it visible inside of this query string up here. We simply want to send the information as form data 
inside of the headers. Let's move on to talk about the various inputs that are available to us when we're using a form. We can create different types of field inputs using the input element and then by setting the type attribute to different values. So for example, if we set the type attribute to text, that will create an input that will allow us to type in text and will also bring up the alphanumeric keyboard uh, on any mobile device. We also have the type of password and this is similar to text except that as the user types, as we saw in the last example, they will get uh, little dots as opposed to the actual letters that they're typing. And this is useful if someone's filling out a form in a public place, like a bus station or a cafe, and there might be someone looking over their shoulder. We also have a type of telephone, which will bring up the numeric keypad on mobile devices. And the type of hidden will allow us to pass information through the form, but it will not be visible to the user. And lastly, we have the type of submit, which creates a submit button for submitting the form. You'll notice that each of the inputs is also labeled with a name attribute. This is the way that we create a label for this information that's sent to the server. You'll notice in the previous example that the name attribute is used as a kind of label. So this way we've set the name attribute to full name and then when we typed in Bob Barkley into that input, the value of Bob Barkley gets assigned to that label, full name. And here you can see on this next one that the name is set to password. So anything the user types into this password input will be set to that label password. Another way to think about it is when this information gets to the server, the server sees password as equal to whatever the user typed in here. So it's always very important to specify the name attribute for any form field that you create. We also have the placeholder attribute available to us in HTML5. And this will allow us to insert placeholder text that will only appear inside of the form field until the user begins to type inside of it. And this is just kind of a reminder of what goes inside of each input. We also lastly have the required attribute, which we can specify simply by writing required inside of the opening input tag. So any input that has been labeled required will report an error message if the user leaves the field blank when they try to submit the form. Another field available to us is the radio inputs. Um, so you can see here that these show up as radio buttons that you can select. And the way this works is we set the type to radio and we make sure that if we have multiple radio buttons, we make sure that the name is set exactly the same, but yet that they have different values. Okay, so this one has the value set to male and this one has the value set to female and then when we click a particular radio button, it will change the, the name label to be set to that value. We also have checkbox inputs, which are similar to radio buttons, except we get the square checkbox instead. And whereas a radio button is really meant for multiple choices where you can really only have one value, checkboxes give you the ability to check off multiple things at once. So in this case, we set the type equal to checkbox and then we have the name set to two different values. So this one's set to vehicle 1 and this one's set to vehicle 2 and they each have their own separate value of bike and car. And this way a person could check either that they have a bike or that they just have a car or they could even check that they have both a bike and a car. We also have select menus, which come in the form of this little nifty drop-down menu. And this is made up of the select input, which here we've given a name of size. And then inside of this opening and closing select input, you can see here there are three different options, which each have their own value, small, medium, or large. If we wish our user to be able to insert multiple lines of text, we can use the text area element, which is made up of this opening and closing text area tag. 
and here we just specify a name to label the value and whatever they type here inside or in between the text area element will be applied as the value. Next let's talk about iframes. Iframes are commonly used to embed other websites inside of your website. So an iframe is kind of like a window that lets you see through to another website. To create an iframe, we use the iframe element made up of this opening and closing iframe tag. And then we specify it with the src attribute to point to the page that we'd like to load inside of this window or this frame. Now in this case, we are linking to a relative path, which is within our own website. And we also have the ability to use full paths or absolute paths that are linking to another website elsewhere in the world. A quick note about iframes is that iframes are not great for search engines. So I would limit my use of iframes to embedding media from other websites such as YouTube, Vimeo, or Google Maps.